It's great to see everyone today. If you're a guest with us today, we welcome you. We're so glad you're here with us. Thank you for being here today. And uh, we, we pray that you are blessed by what you feel in this place today and by the move of the Lord. As always, every t- anytime you feel to give, our offering is available to give at any time. If you would, at the conclusion of this, help us set break down and set up. Many hands continue to make light work. Um, We're praying the Lord give us direction of where to go to next, but right now we're here, so as long as we're here, we need your help in making um, our workload easier at the end. We have such an amazing, faithful group that comes here every week at 8 a.m., It's a group of of people that are just absolutely awesome, and we could not do this without those individuals. They know who they are, and I want to start naming names because I'll probably forget somebody and offend them. They'll leave the church and never come back again. (laughs) Praise God. But thank you for all of that. We could really appreciate if you would help us at the end. Hopefully you received your bulletin today. You notice a couple of things on the back there to pay attention to. Easter Sunday is a special service Special gathering, 10 a.m., so I encourage you to come, bring somebody with you. What a great opportunity to share the gospel with somebody, a friend, a family. Most people go to church on Easter, so why not come here? Amen. Praise God. I want to, we've got just a couple of weeks mentioning that Easter is a little late, is what well, seems like it's a little late this year. It's been early the last number of years. Uh, we started a couple of weeks back with exploring sort of the last week leading up to uh, the, the, uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have two weeks left um, that we're looking at sort of the last week of Jesus and the words and things he did that last week because not only were those words uh, tremendously impactful, but I believe they still hold great impact today in our lives. These were the words, these are the things that he did in his last week on earth as he impacted his uh, 11 disciples uh, that in return, just a few days later, would turn around and become the catalyst for the um, spread of uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. We've spent the last couple of weeks kind of moving through some things and And uh, next week, uh, the Lord's given me something specifically for next week regarding sort of the the last few hours of his life, of Christ's life. But I want to finish today with a portion of Scripture. We're looking at the Gospel of John, and I want to finish today with a a, a very um, important uh, passage of Scripture. I believe there are 21, am I correct? 21, help me somebody out. 21 chapters in in John, am I right on that? 21, I think that's right. Thank you, 21. There are 21 chapters in the book of John. I've said this before, but I like to say it again because it's always someone else in here that's never heard it. Some of you have already heard my spiel on the gospel of John. I I love the gospel of John for a lot of reasons. Uh, And one big reason is that John gives us a perspective of Christ that the other writers of the Gospels uh, really don't give us. And John has 21 chapters, even though John did not label it chapter 1, chapter 2. But basically, we're given 21 chapters of John. And really, four of those chapters, five if you want to stretch it, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. But for for emphasis' sake, we'll, we'll, we'll stop with 16 deal with a few hours of Jesus' life. By the time we're at this part of the story, it's Thursday. Jesus is going to be arrested not far off in a few hours in the middle of early Friday morning. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be put to trial. And by that evening... On Passover, he's going uh, within just a few hours of that, he's going to be put to death. 
So we're at the end here, the, the finish line. He says numerous times in these uh, four chapters, he says numerous times, the hours come. The hours come. The hours come. And so he's giving us all these words in this last portion of, uh, of this, his speech to the eleven. It's in this deal we have the washing of the feet and the final supper and all this stuff. And he, he starts to give some, some words and he finalizes it by John chapter 16 and verse number uh, 25. These are the sort of final words that John gives us. We don't know if this is all the words, but these are the final words that John gives us in regards to this train of thought as Jesus kind of explains his last few uh, key points to his disciples in this intimate setting uh, that we call the Last Supper. But it's this intimate setting that he's giving. He said, verse 25, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I'll ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have loved and believed that I came from God and I came from the Father and have come into the world. And now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, oh, now you are speaking plainly and not using figure to speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Behold, he keeps saying this again. He says it again. Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it is come when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone. Yea, I am not alone for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you that in me, say in me, in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart. There's another translation that says be of good cheer. Another translation says be courageous. Take courage. I have overcome the world. I want you just to take this for a moment and to look at something in context again. I said it last week. I'll say it again this week that uh, Scripture really is best interpreted through context. And I want you to get the context of this moment, this sobering moment where these young men uh, left their livelihoods. Uh, some put down their nets some left their tax collector jobs. Others left family. They took all of that left and followed this guy uh, named Jesus because he offered them an opportunity. He said, come, follow me. And so now they have walked around for three and almost three and a half years, about three years roughly, following this fellow named Jesus. And he's been teaching them and he, they've seen some amazing stuff and there have been times where they kind of thought things were going to go this way and then they kind of went that way and then they kind of went that way. And, 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 and even in this last moment, there's still a little bit of a glimmer of hope inside of them that maybe it's not going to end quite like this. But Jesus is finally giving them these few words. The next chapter of the Gospel of John, uh, we get the prayer that Jesus begins to pray. And then finally, we get the scene after that in verse chapter 18 where he goes into the garden and, and begins to have that whole tug of war with his own will and his own, own, own flesh giving up and drinking the cup. But this is sort of the last culmination. He's looking at this and, and he's staring into the eyes of these young men that he is, have, has been spending three years roughly with sleeping on, in God knows where and, 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 and walking around the countryside and, and seeing all this amazing stuff. And, and he's looking at their eyes and, and he can see what's going on in them and he can he can see what's happening in them and he gives them these final words at the end there he said in the world 
you will have tribulation. But take heart. Be courageous. It's amazing to Dave that if we would take a few moments, and I know I don't often like to do this because some have differing opinions, but I think all of us in true reality, if we would stop for a moment, we would realize that in truth, our world is filled with a lot of fearful people who are just struggling to make sense out of life. Maybe some of in here today, you're just struggling to make sense out of life. We got fears that are private, fears that are personal, individual, but we also have collective fears. It doesn't help today that all of those fears that we sort of deal with are encouraged and sometimes exaggerated and sometimes magnified by the media. And I'm not here to be a media basher. I'm not jumping on all that. That's uh, plenty of other people tweet about that. That is not my job to talk about the media. But let's be honest, 50, 60, 70 years ago, if somebody did some kind of crazy crime in Washington State, it would be months before we heard about it over here. The moment it happens, more than likely your smartphone and my smartphone begins to blow up. To the point now, as crazy as it is, that we have even become numb to certain things. I mean, let's be honest. 20 years ago with the Jomali, 30 years ago, you hear about someone walking in somewhere and killing three or four, five, six people, and you're like, oh my goodness, you can't imagine that. Now you go, well, that's just a Monday. Well, it's just Tuesday. It takes something crazy like in last October in Las Vegas where that guy had that, had that shooting match with killing 60, 70, 80 people, whatever it was, ended up close to 100 people. It takes something crazy because now we've become immune to it because most of us, if we allowed ourselves, I know we've got some brave people, but there are some people in here, if you allowed yourself to go down those roads, I don't even know if we'd leave our house. I'm trying to raise three small children in this crazy world. And I, if, I, if, we, if, if my wife and I allowed ourselves as parents, I would never let my children leave the house. I, 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 uh, I, the, uh, just yesterday, just yesterday we were, in the, we were going through the, the drive through line with about 411 other people at Chick-fil-A. God, I mean, they don't even get, their food is not free. You would think it's free. And so we were like car 97 in line. And by the time, it was right up here, the Watch Apple one. And my, we're sitting in there, and by the time we got around the corner, uh, we, one of the smaller bladders in the back seat says, I need to go. <laughs> and you know what? She's 12 years old, and and I would wish in our society that at 12 years old, she's responsible enough. But you know what? There was something in us. And you know, whatever, this is not a parenting seminar, okay? Time out, okay? Don't go down this road. But it's something that's like, we can't just let her go in there by herself. How crazy is that? It's Chick-fil-A. Come on, people. They got a cow dressed up giving away ice cream to kids. But you can't let your child at 12 years old go in there. Why? Because there's nutty people in this world. And it's only touching a small part of the wackiness. There's so much stuff that we could. Such a massive accumulated amount of stuff that we process every day. And that now, because we have access to all this information, we're just inundated all the time with stuff. But the other part about it is, not only do we deal with this, but on the other side, we are a materialistic culture. In between the news stories of the mass shootings or the crazy robberies or all the nuttiness that's going on or all the overdoses, in between all those are commercials advertising you to buy more stuff. Again, don't, don't, I'm, not go, don't, I'm not going where you think I'm going, okay? So don't, I'm not here to get on some soapbox. 
I'm on the Jesus box today. I'm not on the soap box. So I just got to make these points. You all know this, but let's just take it. So we've got this sort of back and forth deal that our world is different. In, in one standpoint, we've got such nuttiness and chaos and craziness, and there's so much stuff, and there's so much going on. I mean, it's just all kinds of wild things happening in our world. And on the other side, we've got this other part about that our world is so materialistically driven. If you've got stuff, you're told that the stuff you've got is outdated. You need new stuff. So what do we do now? They build storage units every other block because people don't have enough room in their house to store all the stuff they got to put away to get the new stuff they're bringing in. And we've got this sort of Two sides of the coin that we're in the middle of. And here we are as disciples of Jesus Christ as people that's on a Sunday morning sitting in a room trying to get closer to Jesus and we're stuck in this mess. And on one side we've got the chaos and on one side we've got all this none of this and we've got sickness, disease and all this craziness happening. Planes falling out of the sky and, and, and all kinds of none of this. Over here we've got all this materialism. That's kind of just eating at us, eating at us, eating at us. And what's crazy about it is that the more materialistic a culture becomes, the more stuff occupies us. Because the more materialistic we become, the more we're driven to get more so we can buy more. And we get in this vicious cycle where in order to feel like we have life and enjoy life, we've got to have more, but we know we can't afford more. So either we either run up debt so high we feel overwhelmed and we can't get out of bed, or we work so hard that we have no time for anything else. Why? Because this world is feeding that self-individual. And now all that produces this attitude. If we're not careful, that sort of idea produces this self-centered, selfish attitude. I'm not a social media basher. I'm not here again. This is not a bash on anything. I, I buy stuff. I enjoy I'm Amazon comes to my house <laughs> regularly. I love Amazon. I mean, the other night, it's 12 o'clock, 12, 15 at night, and we're, um, we finally got our, we we're sitting there, and with, when, you're, when, you're at, when you're parents of three small kids, your day does not begin until about 9 o'clock at night. You got to do work later. So we're trying to get some stuff done, and it's like 12, 15, and we got to go to bed, and, and we're like, you know what, I for, we got to get this one item. My wife said, can you get it? I'm like, yeah, Amazon. I went on there, and when you believe, it's amazing. I'm telling you, that Prime stuff is legit. If you're not a Prime member, I'm telling you. And I, I ordered it at 12, 15 at night, and for free, well, not for free, I'm a Prime member, but they'll get you some way. But literally, I got that bad boy the next day at like 1 o'clock. I never want to leave my house. I mean, seriously. How awesome was that? I mean, click, one day delivery, free. It was on my dad. Didn't have to go anywhere. Now I forgot my story. Where was I going? I'm just so happy with Amazon. Oh, and social media basher. That's what I was going to say. But let's be honest. Social media has elevated the individual. I've joked about it before. I'm not going down the road. But what the number one picture that's taken every day in this world, the number one picture that's taken on smartphones is a selfie, a me picture. That's the attitude. And so in this attitude, we've got this whole deal. And here's the problem. The problem with that is it begins to erode what we're really built for. There's an erosion inside of us. Because I believe in this, this, this three-chapter part that Jesus gives us, there are three realities, if you want to call that, three fundamental things that human beings need. Because in these three chapters, if you study these last parts of Jesus, now he's talking to these young boys, and he's trying to tell them, guys, for the next little while, it's going to get rough. 
And, and not only is it going to get rough, but it's going to be rough as we go farther. So how did these young boys go from Brother Trombley being so afraid at what was going to happen, they locked themselves in a room, to only years later being willing to stand and be crucified, burned alive, thrown off buildings? How, what was the transition? Because to me, it would have been easier to be crucified when Jesus was standing next to you. Because you could see him. But yet they were willing to do that after. But there's a transition. Part of that transition began right here in this room. At this final 24 hours before the madness began and all the chaos broke left, this is that last little bit of quietness. It's the last little bit where Jesus is alone in this intimate setting and he's able to talk to these men straight face, eyeball to eyeball, without any distraction, and he's talking to them, and there's three realities that he focuses on. Love, faith, and hope. I believe in here today that all of us, all of us, deal with these three realities. The first reality is love. We need love. We need to be loved. We need to be loved unconditionally. We need to be loved lavishly. We need to be loved generously. We need to be loved by someone who knows all of our faults and still loves us anyways. Second is we need someone to believe in. We need someone to trust. Someone to hold our faith to. Someone who's consumed with our well-being. Someone whose hands we can place our lives in who's powerful enough and generous enough and has enough resources to secure us in the midst of an insecure world. We need someone that will love us, care for us, and someone that has the power to rescue us. Finally, the third reality is we need someone that we can have hope in. We need hope. We need someone or something that we know that there's a future. We need to be able to see the light at the end of the ever-darkening tunnel of our world and our life and our situation and our problems. We need to know that there's a plan that goes beyond just the repeating of everyday life. Get up, go to work, come home. Get up, go to work, come home. Get up, go to work, come home. And then work for the weekend so we can have a little bit of time set aside to do what we want to do so we can get enough energy and enough refreshing to start the cycle back over again. And we wonder, is there a plan? We need to know there's a plan. We need someone that will give us a purpose, a future. We need to know that there's something good is going to happen. We need to know that there's something far greater than any of the bad experiences that occupy our, our lives. Faith, love, faith, and hope. It's funny that these three sort of pieces of this conversation that Jesus has with his disciples is echoed later by the Apostle Paul in his writings when he said these three things these three things faith, hope and charity but the greatest of these is charity. That Paul later on said these three elements of life, these three things, these things, this faith, this hope, and the love, these three things. He even later on said it in Thessalonians. He echoed it again in Colossians. These three things. You see, you say, what about peace and joy? But if you look about the, these are the three foundations because really peace is the negative side. What I say the negative side, meaning peace is the absence of something. 
Because in order to have peace, it's the absence of fear. It's the absence of anxiety. It's the absence of trouble. To have peace, it's the negative. Joy is the positive. Joy, I'm not saying peace is a negative thing. And don't go down those roads. Every battery has a positive and negative side. Every, every magnet has a, a north and a south end. It's not saying that one's negative. But meaning peace is the absence of anxiety. Peace is the absence of fear. Joy is the presence. Even in the midst of chaos. But what are the products? Those are the products, the foundational part that Jesus, and we'll get to this in just a moment, because I want to just get into that last statement he made just a little deeper over the next few minutes. But he's this whole thing revolves. If you go back and you've got a Bible that does this, a lot of online Bibles do it. And I like it. If you, you've got a Bible, you don't really have it in your, if you have a written Bible, not many people care that anymore. Uh, but if you have an electronic Bible, a lot of, the, a lot of people do, a lot of see elect, electronic Bibles do this. It gives headings. Now those headings were not there in the original text, but the, the, the translators and the, the Bible interpreters, in order to kind of help you sift through stuff, put headings. And go back and read the headings of these four chapters, of the different parts of this, and you'll notice that there's a theme. There's one part he talks about, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Any man would, would love me and hate the world. All this back and forth revolves around love, faith, hope. Love, faith, hope. Hope, love, faith, hope, love, faith, hope. Continue, repeat it over and over again until we get to this last part. Where they look at Jesus and he's finally said to them in this last scripture, this last 25, uh, starting in verse 25, he said to them numerous times, the hour has come, the hour has come. Okay, fellas, I know we've been talking about it, but guess what? The hours come, and I could just imagine looking at those boys' eyes, and Peter, and James, and John, and Andrew, and Philip, and Matthew. All these young men, they're looking at him, and it's starting to sink in. The reality of the moment is starting to sink in, that Jesus is going to die. And I know he had said that I'm going to die and be resurrected, but let's be honest, they were human beings. They didn't know that. It's easy for us to say on the other side, of course he's going to be resurrected. They didn't really... They were struggling with that. So they're looking at this last words and he's saying, listen. And he keeps talking about dying and leaving, dying and leaving. And so obviously, the more he talks about dying and leaving, the more they're full of concern and anxiety. Because you know what? While they've been with him, he's been with them. They've had somebody to love them. Why he's been with them, they've had somebody to believe. Hey, it's, let's be honest, we are sitting here today crazy. Let's talk about it for just a second because it sounds nutty when you think about it. And a few minutes ago, Sister Gina, you did something really weird. You closed your eyes and you lifted your hands and you talked to somebody and there was nobody around you. Are you okay? Because you think about it, it looks retarded we walk into a room and a bunch of people are going what are they doing because we look in this room and go who are they talking about some crazy guys up there running back and forth dancing and screaming what is he doing this is this is weird because we can't see the one that fills this room we can feel him we can't see him but Imagine, they got to sit and walk with Jesus in the flesh. So while he was with them, John, they had somebody they could really look into. They could believe. In fact, we know how they operated. Because there was many times that Jesus would intercede and would intercede and take requests in prayer. What requests? Because to them... The way to the Father was through Him. So they got this whole idea, and He's talking now about leaving, and while He was with them, they had somebody that loved them. Now they had someone they could believe in. And guess what? They had someone who could deliver them from any situation. Got no food? Don't matter. 
Anybody got any stale bread? We got, a, we got a God who's able to make that bread into a gourmet meal. No big deal. You're in a storm? Don't worry. Hunker down. Just wait a minute. He'll come walking on the water. It's okay. You're sick? Don't worry. He'll be around. Just hold on. Jesus is coming. He's just outside right now taking a walk. When he comes back in, all will be well. That's the reality of it. That's what they live with. They got that whole idea. So there's a comfort and a hope that they dealt with. As long as they stuck with Jesus, they knew everything was going. If I'm in the boat with Jesus, I know the boat's not going down. As long as I'm hanging out with Jesus, I'm going to be okay. But he's leaving. He's going. He won't be here anymore. He's dying. And then on top of that, he told them, you're going to be persecuted the same way I was persecuted. You're going to be hated, resented, rejected. Not only that, but this is going to go on for the rest of time. They're going to arrest you. In Luke 21, he said, they, even people are going to turn against you brother against brother. Family against family. Society is going to turn against you. They're even going to throw you out of the synagogue to these Jewish boys. They said they're going to throw you out. And some of them said they're even going to kill you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's going on here? It's a change of tactics. He started off saying, come follow me. I'll make you fishers men. And now he's telling them, uh, boys, it's not going to go well for you. This is the reality of the Christian walk and the Christian faith. Because when we come to God, we come be broken, busted, and disgusted. And He puts us all back together again. And what a joyous moment that is! But then somewhere along the line, the reality strikes. Wait a minute. He's not making life perfect. I heard someone say that God came to give you life and life more abundantly. God came to give you life... And when you come to Christ, life more abundantly. <laughs> the reality of it. And he says, hey, it's not going to go well. So he closes out the evening. It's now in the early hours of Friday morning. It's past midnight. Over the next 24 hours, the events are going, that are going to unfold are going to be the pivotal events of all of human history. Over the next 24 hours, all of human history will change forever. History will be written over again based off what takes place in the next 24 hours. And in the last moments, he looks at them and he says, in this world, you have tribulation." But he says to them in the beginning, he said, these things have I spoken to you in figurative language. But the hour will come later when I will speak to you no longer in figurative language, but will plainly talk to you. They kind of get back to him and said, you know, are you now speaking plainly or not using figurative speech? Notice this, that throughout the Gospels, Jesus talked in parables. But Brother Trombley, after the Gospels, you know this, but after the Gospels, nobody else spoke, spoke in parables. There were never parables ever after that. Only Jesus spoke in parables. And everything Jesus said, there was enough light for you to believe in, but still enough Darkness that you kind of left wondering, going, what does he really mean? Some of the statements that Jesus made, I imagine when we read them, we understand what they mean. We understand, but some of the things that Jesus said had to have seemed weird to them. He talked about tearing down temples, and he talked about uh, uh, being a door and all this stuff was this sort of there was truth in it but that sort of left them kind of puzzling their head but then he finishes this with this very very straightforward statement the word tribulation there is we think of tribulation in the English language we heard the tribulation we think of sort of like a trial or 
or a period of time, but that word tribulation there is the word thalipsis, which means pressure, affliction, or distress. Or to literally be crushed, to be pressured, sort of like a pressure cooker. You ever heard the term now? We, we use the term, it's got to blow off steam. Oh, don't mind them, they're just blowing off steam. What does that mean? Exactly. That means, I mean, my, my, my mom, for years when I was growing up, she, she, she's southern, and so she cooked a lot with the, 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 with, the, with the pressure cooker on the stove. And that thing, my goodness, when it let off steam... And that's how some of you are. And just the right person coming around at the wrong time. I want to ask you if you know anybody in your life that has a button. Straight ahead, look straight ahead. Don't look to the right or left. Oh boy. <laughs> no. <laughs> You have a button. What's that button? It's a big red button that when you push it, all the internal angst gets released. Why? Because there's a buildup of pressure. And I got to be honest with you. Yes, the Lord can help you, but a lot of that buildup, He predicted. In this world, you're going to have pressure. In this world, you're going to have feel like your head is being screwed between two, two vices and being crushed on a daily basis. You're going to have pressure and distress and tribulation. This is what's going to happen. He says this, even in verses chapter 15 and 16, he goes over this again and again. And Paul, later on in Thessalonians, is speaking to some believers, and he says, no one should be disturbed by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we have been destined for this. Don't be disturbed by the afflictions. We've been destined for the afflictions. So what does all this mean? I'm getting to this. It, trust me, it's a long lead up to a short conclusion. But I want you to understand this. So in the face of this pressure, in the face of this world that we're living in, the tribulation, in the face of what these young men are looking at, how do you survive? How do we not only survive the world we're living in, but live a life where we can get up and smile about life? And our smile is not dependent on everything going good. Our smile is not dependent on if we have no problems. Because if that's the case, you'll never smile. The moment you think you have no problems, you are a fool because problems only make more room for more problems. So the only time you have more problems is in the shift of no problems is in the shift of getting rid of one problem to make room for a new problem. Feel encouraged. I'm getting there. I feel a spirit of encouragement. You're just, your encouragement is just flying through the roof. Basically, he's told me my life is terrible and it's not getting any better, but smile anyways. I should have stayed home. I knew that. But watch this. He gives us this. He gives us this sword that in the world, I, I, I kind of like can't imagine. They kind of looked at him like when he made the statement, in this world, you will have tribulation. They kind of looked at him like, duh. You keep telling us that, and you're telling us you're leaving us. Of course, we're going to have tribulation. And then he says these words take courage. Now, this is cool. You want to see something cool? This is cool. You ready? There's just some things in Scripture that's just cool. Take courage. There's a reason why he says these words. Some, some translations say take heart. Some say be good cheer. Cheer up. Watch this. The word take courage is theraseat. I'm not a Greek scholar. I don't know if I just completely butchered that. 
T-H-A-R-S-E-I-T-E. Take courage is one Greek word. Now, I'm not, I'm not an English person, and I, I don't understand all this, but some, so some of you understand this better than I did. But this isn't a verb. It's a verb, and it's an imperative verb, meaning it's a command. He gives this as a command. It's not just simply a pat on the back, take, hey, take courage. This is a command, take courage. But here's the cool part. That Greek word is only used in the Gospels and only person ever to speak that word written in the Bible was Jesus. No other writer used that word. So the one in which courage relies on was the only one that could demand you take courage, but not take courage in yourself and your skill set and your ability to cope, but take courage, be of good cheer, take heart, because I, I, have overcome the world. The only person who could give that command in Scripture, the only person to give that command in Scripture was Jesus because he was the only one. So you know what? This wasn't, in the end, a pep talk. It wasn't just a feel-good session of come alongside. You know what I've learned? And I don't mean this negatively. And, and I, this is going to sound like I'm being critical. I'm really not. It's just an observation. I find that a lot of times in counseling, people don't really want to know the answer. They just want someone to talk to. It's true. Because when you give them the answer, they don't pay attention to it. Seriously. So I've learned over the years, the more I've counseled, is to just stop talking. Let them talk. Either they're going to get the answer the more they talk, or they'll get off the chest, they'll leave better, they think you're amazing because you helped them and you didn't do anything. Because I found the most of the time when you tell somebody what God gives you to tell them, in one ear, out the other. But Jesus is sitting here with these fellows and he's not giving them a pep talk. He's not trying to say, now boys, listen, let me tell you something. I'm not going to be with you much longer, and it's going to be tough. There's a mean world out there. And, uh, and if, and if, in a little while, you're going to see me up on a cross, and uh, it's not going to be a pretty picture. But uh, don't worry about it. You just, you just work through it and be okay, and uh, everything's going to be okay, guys. You just, I know it's going to be tough, so don't worry about it. But uh, it's just I love you, and... Um, we're, we're, to, we're in this together. So let's just, let's, maybe we should give a group hug or something. I don't really, that wasn't what the whole, that's, that wasn't the picture. He's, he's giving these boys final understanding that this life that you think you were destined for, where we're going to be ruling and reigning and you're going to be captains and all this stuff, it ain't going to happen. In fact, you think we're going this way, we're going this way. Do you notice in God, the way up is down? Can I just help somebody understand that? If you want to go up into God, prepare to go down. If you want God to take you higher, you're going to have to get lower. That's just principle of Jesus 101. If you want Him to increase, you're going to have to decrease. And He's telling you, hey, guess what, fellas? This is going to be great. But it's going to stink. And it's going to get rough. And, and just in case you want to know, they're going to hate you like they hated me. They're going to persecute you. They're going to throw you in jail. In fact, you, Pedro, are going to deny me three times. This whole thing's going to go crazy. But I want you to tell you something. In this world, you're going to have tribulation. But take courage. Be of good cheer. That was not 
the final words of a pep talk. But that was a command and an order to take courage and to smile and to look tribulation in the face and problems and difficulties in the face and stand courageous because he has overcome the world. But all of that was built upon the foundation of the fact that I am loved, I believe, and I have hope. And in this room today, God, I guarantee you, most of us in this room, God is working on one of those areas in our lives. He's working on love, He's working on faith, and He's working on hope. Why? Because without those three realities in your life, you cannot obey that Scripture. You can't obey that Scripture. You cannot stand in tribulation and take courage because He's overcome the world. Because if you don't have love and you don't have faith and you don't have hope, you cannot look at the tribulation in this world. So without faith, hope, and love, there's anxiety, fear, Stress, doubt, worry, confusion. Keep going down the list. It gets bigger and bigger. And if one of those things is in your life today, it's not because you're a bad person. It's not because you somehow failed. It's not because you're broke. It's not because you're to some disposition. Somewhere in this, you need to go back to the elements that Jesus gave these young men. And you need to say, is there a love disconnect? Am I disconnected in my faith? Or is there a hope not in me? Because if I have love... And I have faith and I have hope. The fruit of that becomes peace and joy. And I have the ability to obey what Jesus looked at them and said that day. And he said, take courage. Because here's the beauty about it. He tells them this, which seems to be quite interesting. This last little, little, little Blanketed statement. In fact, just for emphasis sake, would you, I, I, you're probably asleep back there behind the curtain, but can you, 16, John 16, I haven't used any scripture today. So here's your chance, 16 verse 25. Help me out there. I don't know who's back there, so they'll still love me here. These, C, is CJ back there? CJ, you're a good guy. These things have I spoken to you in a figurative language, but the time is coming when I'll no longer speak to you, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. And then he goes on, verse 26, In that day you will ask in my name, and do not say to you that I will pray the Father for you. You don't need me anymore to have to go to the Father. Next one, verse 27. And he said, But the Father himself loves you. There's that word again. Loves you. And because you have loved me, and have, there's that believed faith. If the, you understand that the Father loves you and you believe the Father, then you will believe that I came from God. And when you put these elements together, something happens. Because you see, you've got to understand the context. And I'm fired up because we're at the end and I'm excited about where we got to after all this time. You've got to look at it. These young men were born as Jews. They were born in the Jewish faith. That the only way to get to God in that way was to get into the holiest of holies which they had no access to. So when Jesus comes along, they had access to the Father because they had access in this fellow called Jesus. But he's telling them. Now it's easy for us to see it on this side, but they didn't see it too easily on that side. He's telling them, guys, in just a little while, this was before they understood the cross. This before they understood the death, the burial, and the resurrection. This is on this side. This is still in that figure of speech side. But he said there's going to be a time where you're not going to need me. Meaning, me in the flesh. You're not going to need me in the flesh. We know later he comes in the Spirit and all this stuff and fills us. We're, we get there in a second. But he said, you're not going to need me in the flesh anymore to take your needs to the Father. But there's coming the day when you're going to be able to go to the Father yourself and you'll have access to the Father. And anything you say in my name, the Father will give. Because what they did not know was just within a few hours after that, that on that cross... 
when he uttered those final words, it is finished. That the words that were given to them just a few hours prior to that, that they didn't understand. When he said, it is finished. And the veil of the temple was torn in half. And finally, what was inaccessible became accessible to everyone. Because what you had to be special to get into had access to everybody. Now, they understood. And I won't know what happened. The Bible doesn't say. Maybe Brother Trombley, maybe if you come across it, can share it later. I don't know when they got the news of the temple. I don't know where they were hanging out when they got the news. I can't imagine. I don't even know how the news spread. The Bible doesn't really tell us how it is. They obviously had known it because John records that the veil was rent and torn. But I don't know who told who, how it got out. But I can imagine when they got the word, hey, do you guys know what happened? When he said those words, at the same time he said those words, that the veil, you got to understand, the reverence that they would have had for that. This is something by that time had been in, in, in play for thousands of years. It wasn't just something that was just a few. This is something that had been, been there for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years this veil had been. The, 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 the wall was now gone. You know what's amazing today? And I finalize with this. You don't need me to get to God. You don't need these men on this platform or anybody else in this room to get to God. You have access to God on your own. You have access to Him on your own. Every person, I know today we look at that and it seems such like a, such a, oh, of course we have access to God. But you don't understand what we have and what's available to us in this room. And the reason why I say that you don't understand it, you know it intellectually, but you haven't truly experienced it experientially. Why? Because you would not have come in this room today carrying what you're carrying if you really believed you had access to the true King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You would not have come in this room today trodden down, burdened, if you really understood who you had access to. That you don't need me to pray for you. You don't need the person next to you to pray for you. If we do, great. If we don't, it doesn't matter. But you have access into the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That you have access. And when you understand that you have access, and when you understand that you don't need anybody and there's a great world religion that has that is the Lord one of the largest if not the largest institutions of religion in this world teaches that you have to have a mediator to get they even teach the fact that Mary has to be that mediator well no offense to Mary but I don't need Mary to get to Jesus. No offense to Mary. And I'm not here to disgrace or to say anything negatively about the mother of Jesus Christ. But I don't need her to get to Jesus. Because my Bible says that I, yes, a sinner, messed up, mistake ridden, Living with stuff, living with junk, been knocked down, been kicked down, been, been allowed life to get the best of me. I have access. I've got access. You've got access. You've got access. The person on the right, the person on the left, you have access. And when we understand that we have access, I'm glad you're here today, but you don't have to come here to have access. You can have access in your car. You can have access in your home. You can have access on your job. You can have access no matter where you are. You don't have to yell to have access. It could just be a whisper, but you have access. 
when you think about that, when you think about we have access, I got to be honest with you, when you really get a hold of that, it's not just, oh, of course we have access. Okay, but my life still stinks. But no, when you realize you have access, there's something that gets a hold of you that says, you know what? My life, not great. Tribulation, check. Trials, check. Distresses, check. But any time I'm overwhelmed and I'm in the pressure cooker, I've got a place I can run to because I've got access. The Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower the righteous run into and are saved. It's not the church that's the tower. It's not singing that's the tower. It's not preaching that's the tower. But it's Jesus. When you're under pressure and you're, you're in the cooker, what's the first place you've got to go? Is the first place you've got to go is your speed ball to find the most spiritual person you know because you've got to get access to them? No, baby. Mm. Oh, old song that says he's just as close as the mention of his name. Jesus. Jesus, he's just as close as the mention. But here's the problem, right? Now stop over here. I'm, I'm trying to finish, but Jesus is not done. Just give me five more minutes. Here's the problem. But Brother Jolin, would you stand, sir? You play God for a second. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. Look. We, look, here's the deal. Here's the problem. We want to live our life separated from him, but we want to have the same benefits of being next to him. So we want to live our life separate because we want control, we want to do our thing, we want to run our own world, whatever. But anytime we have problems, we want him to be right there to pick it back up. And then we say, thank you, Lord. Appreciate you for showing up. I got it now. Go back. To your place. But you see, when you call the name, when you call and have access, you're like, I've tried that. It didn't work. You know what? If I'm this far away and I'm in trouble, it's going to take him a few minutes to get over here. But you know what? See, it's okay. Here's what happens, right? Here's what happens. Sunday, I'm all up next to Jesus. I'm his first cousin. God, you're so good. You're so wonderful. I need you in my life. You are so good, Lord. I could not make it without you. Oh, we're done? Okay, appreciate it. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Oh, Sunday. God, you're so good. I... I've missed you this week. Just want to let you know you're the only thing in my life that matters. Oh, okay. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Isn't it amazing how much stuff happens on Saturday? How come people never have problems Monday through Friday? Saturday comes along. Saturday. Oh, oh, oh. God, where are you? I need you. God, where are you? I can't feel you. <laughs> but you know what I don't know how you are you live your life like you want to but guess what today when you leave you got a choice alright we got the command be a good cheer overcome the world great but you know what that's a good bumper sticker it don't mean a hill of beans for most of you because here's why you got a choice today when you leave you can leave God here. Say, boy, that was great. Thank you for making me feel better, helping me today. I'll see you next week. And you can leave him here. And you can live your life and then come next week and show up a Sunday morning, clean up, aisle one. God, I'm here, and I really need you to clean up. There's an old song that say, comes sometimes on the morning. on, the, on the, there's a, what, What's the 88.9, the, the, the gospel? Um, I don't got, what's that? Somebody, I know some of y'all listen to that. 
Yes. Who just said that? Thank you. I know that. Me and Brother Johnny, we got it. There's an old song. The song comes on. It says, I'm going to clean up what I messed up. Started my life over again. Oh, see? Oh, it's going to clean up. Woo! What I messed up. Yes. Yes, yeah, see? I knew I had some people listen to radio. But you know what? I'm not bashing the song, but that's what I live. He's going to clean up what I messed up. But if I'm walking with him, and today when I leave, instead of leaving him here, you got another choice. Here's option B. Option A, leave him here. Option B is, would you mind holding my hand for a second? Okay. Okay. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't work to do that. Okay. Here's what we can do. Here's, here's another way. Option B. Leave him here. Option B. Lord, follow me. I know where I'm going. Yes. You better get a picture of this quickly. Never happen it again. I can follow. God, you follow me. Wherever, wherever I go. Oh, it's, it's, this is officially documented now. <laughs> All right, God, wherever I go. That's when you leave. Most of us, we do take God with us, but he's in the trailing position. He's only there if we need him because we make a wrong step. Oh, God, I messed up. Can you fix this so I can try again? But the true way to be able to take courage, because you know what? Guarantee you, this week, let me give you a news. You're going to have a bad day. Some of you may get fired this week. Some of you may get a bill in the mail you weren't expecting. Be a good cheer. Yeah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You know what? Guess what? You're going to have a flat tire. Your car's going to need repairs. You're going to have some stuff. But how do I make it through that? Here's why. Where he goes. Because if he's already in the problem before I get there, I can take cheer because he's already got the solution before I even showed up. Because I know he's ahead of me. And as long as I'm walking behind him, he's already got it under control. And as long as I stay with him, everything is going to be okay. Stand with me today. So some of you in this room, you need to change your posture before you leave here. I know I've gone a few minutes longer, forgive me, but I'll be done here in about 30 seconds. Some of you need to make a decision. You've got a choice. Leave God here, pick him up next week. He'll still be here. He ain't going anywhere. He'll be here. Option two, bring him with you. You take the lead. Let him follow so he can clean up what you mess up. Or the third option, so that you can have that command and be of good cheer and take courage and take heart and smile in the face of hell when hell's looking at you and chomping at the bit and it seems like all the demons of hell are smiling and having a good time and a party at your expense and you can smile back to them. Do you know why? Because you've got a God that's leading the charge in front of you and as long as you're on there, do you know why I can go to the cross? Because he went to the cross. Do you know what I can endure? Because he's endured. So he became the first partaker of the fruit so I can follow with him. But it's your choice. What are you going to do about it? Your choice. You got three options. Leave him here. You take him with you, but you, you, you lead the way. And you just have him there as your mop-up duty. Or you finally get in the right place and say, God, every step that I take, you're already ordained. Guess what? The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And when I think of that, this is the image that comes to me, okay? Final thought. The image that comes to me is if you ever walked on a beach or somewhere that has mud or somewhere you could see indented footprints and you've watched and you've seen those and, and you've ever tried to re either walk on those footprints or maybe walk in somebody else's footprints... When it says the steps of good men are ordered by the Lord, I picture that as God is walking in front of me, 
leaving footprints behind me and my job is to just step where he stepped on the places he stepped because he's already been there and it's already secure and I know if I step where he stepped everything's going to be okay so that step's ordained and that step's ordained and that step's ordained but if I'm in front I can't live in ordained steps so you got a choice today it's not a choice you just make. See, here's this. This is a Monday morning choice, not a Sunday afternoon choice. So in about three minutes, about, about 30 seconds from now, we're going to quit. We're going to go start cleaning up. And you're going to say, well, what was all that about? Because this is a Monday morning challenge, not a Sunday afternoon challenge. Because everybody here today is going to be, yes, I got it. I'm going to let Jesus lead me. But when you wake up in the morning, is he going to be in front? Because when you hit when the rubber hits the road in the morning, where is he going to be? Is he going to be in the trail position? Is he going to be left here across the middle school? Or is he going to be in front of you? It's your choice. And if he's not, then you need to make the corrections. Father, we love you. Thank you, Father, for your word. I felt the challenging move of your spirit. I felt the challenge of your word. I pray now in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would seal this word in our hearts, that this would not be done based on an emotional response in the moment. Even for, although for some in this moment, they may need to repent for their error of their ways. But God, this is a challenge that you've said, just like you commanded those, those young men that day in that room where you told them, take courage. Today, I believe you're speaking to us, Lord, to take courage but the only way we can take courage is if you're leading the way. God, give us the grace to put you in the proper order of our life. Not to leave you here, not to have you following, but where you lead me, I will follow. Where you go, I will go. Let that be the mission of my heart. When I wake up in the morning, let that be the destiny and the mission of my heart. Let that be the, the, the faith of my existence. Where you lead, I will follow. I don't want to go anywhere or do anything that you have not first led me to do. And if I can do that, God, you guaranteed me that I will be an overcomer because you have overcome. And if you've overcome and I walk in you, then I can overcome. I speak these things in Jesus' name. I speak them and seal them in the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Praise God. God bless you. Shake somebody's hand. Hug their neck. Let's go have a great Sunday of small groups today.